Anyway, just want to welcome all of you to the second episode of Ben Wangan's Web3 and Music Video Podcast. Yeah, we're really so grateful to do this. And just to give an intro about why we're going about all this. You know, in the past year, we've been noticing Web3 just really growing as a concept. The idea of blockchains, NFTs, really providing new use cases for creators to monetize their work and for fans to engage with artists in new ways. And we really wanted to contribute to that knowledge resource, especially for the music industry in Asia and speaking to some of the top minds in this space. So in the last episode, we had Charlie Crown ETH, we had MSFT talking about how it's like being a Web3 native producer. And we're going to be continuing this in our later episodes with more and more talented individuals in this space. And I just want to say... a. Huge hello to everyone watching this. I think it's crazy times in the world, but yet we are optimistic as COVID kind of eases out here in Asia. People are getting out more and uh, resuming festivals, concerts are coming back. And also the continued growth of blockchain and NFTs and how that's impacting the music space. And just want to say that I'm so grateful to be able to be living in a time like this where we're seeing so much innovation happen. And today we have a very special guest, CXY, the co-founder of Cardoid FM, an awesome, awesome product. And he's going to be telling us a bit more about it. And um, I got to know him via MSFT. And he told me this is an awesome guy who's bridging Web 2 and Web 3 in music. And we're going to get to know him more in this session. All right. So hello, CXY. Hi. I'm so happy to be here. And you're right now in Seattle, right? That's right. Uh, Seattle, Washington, on the Pacific Northwest, uh, right below Canada. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a gateway to Asia for the bulk of uh, the U.S. Uh, traffic traveling through uh, Seattle. Awesome. And you know, when I was talking to MSFT, he was saying, hey, this is one guy you've got to meet. He loves music. He loves tech. And he's kind of fusing both together with this awesome platform. So before we kind of dive into what you're doing, maybe give us a sense of like your background, how you kind of got into music, you know, went into this rabbit hole of just collecting and, uh, you know, how it's kind of led you to where you are today. Yeah, no, I'd love to. Uh, I'll, I'll, try to I'll try to be concise, but I, I love talking about it. So I came up in the sort of traditional Asian household, like, learn a classical instrument from a young age. Uh, both my parents were uh, trained as uh, concert pianists. Um, so I started off in piano. I was terrible, so I switched to cello. I was reasonable, so I played cello through high school. And in college, I ditched it, and I went into college radio. Uh, so I did a bunch of DJing, hung out at the radio station all hours, uh, did mobile DJing, was completely fascinated by DJing. And really, that was when I got into pop music, because prior to that, it was all classical all the time. Uh, so that that was sort of the birth of my understanding of collecting, curation, a groove, getting a crowd moving, um, sort of the, the social aspects of music, what it, how, it, how it brings people together um, and how it forms identities. Um, and then from there, I, I, uh, I, I studied computer science and I studied architecture in college. I ended up working at Microsoft um, and I worked on boring stuff like office apps, but mostly consumer stuff. I worked on um, a product called Real Arcade at Real Networks, which was like a consumer casual gaming platform. Um, but what really excited me uh, in 2000, after I was kind of like uh, finishing up at Microsoft and starting at Real Networks, was Napster. So Napster sort of blew my mind as a DJ who had to go out and like, like flip through shelves at the radio station for vinyl, um, shop record stores looking for obscure 12 inch singles. Like the, the accessibility of everything was, was like life changing. Um, so I spent a good portion of time that I should have been working at Real Networks just like, like cruising Napster um, mm -hmm. and browsing other people's catalogs and yep. seeing what other people really were collecting. Um, and that, so that really opened my mind to what the possibilities of you know, like free distribution of all music and what it meant to sort of like be a music fan. And it wasn't just about listening to only what you could afford to buy. It was listening to what you found most interesting. Um, and that was the germ of what ended up becoming Cardioid, which was like, let's like I, a friend of mine at that I found at the time when I was working at Real Networks, um, his name's Carl. He goes by CLT on Twitter. 
Um, we had a lot of discussions around what was possible in uh, in this new world where music distribution was free and you could listen to anything, anytime, any genre, any artist. Um, and we had all these ideas and, 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 and as luck would have it, you know, 20 years later, most of these ideas had not been implemented. So we thought, okay, you know what, if we're going to want to see these come to fruition, we're going to have to do it ourselves or at least try. Mm -hmm. uh, so that brings us to where we are today. Um, I'm still like a mostly a dance music house head, just to answer your earlier question about like what I'm into, funk, um, just anything with a groove. I'm all over it. That's a lot, a lot of that's just from my, uh, my, my sort of DJ heritage. Um, but yeah, that's, that's sort of like, uh, that, that's how I got here. Nice. Nice. And you talked about this, like 10 years of kind of observing the space and some of the solutions that you thought of, what were the main problems or gaps that you were noticing? Um, I, I think the, the, the way music has, like, I, I think of the, the, the most interesting problem with, with music is how people relate with music. Um, and I think, you know, for the longest time, it was like iTunes. It's a, there's, there's an app you use to play the music that you've, you've collected. Mm -hmm. And um, the, it, it really hasn't changed since then. The way people interact with music hasn't really changed with them since then. In fact, it's become more, even more UI-less, more passive since the days mm -hmm. of iTunes and Napster. Um, so I think what, what's, what's, uh, what the opportunity is uh, that, that we really wanted to explore is how to connect the listener to the artist as part of the listening process. Um, as opposed to just, you know, what, 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 what sort of like Napster has kind of metastasized into Spotify today, which is like, how can you remove the artist's identity from what people are listening to? Because like the way people listen to most music is they kick off a station. It plays whatever they want to kind of like feel. It ref it's, it's a feel that reflects their mood or amplifies their mood. And that's how people see music as a utility. It's not about an artist that makes the music that they fall in love with. And so uh, kind of rambling on a bit here, but like, it's really the, the, the focus, that, the focal point that we wanted to, 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 to solve was how do we get the listener to care about the artist and to make the artist the focal point of listening. Mm. Well, I really like that. And it's interesting because I think you're, uh, you don't necessarily start your thesis thinking about Web3 and trying to solve it backwards. But what I'm hearing from you is a very human thing. It's about connection. It's about increasing the accessibility between the artists and uh, the fan, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Now, so now tell me more about how you got into Web3 and how that eventually kind of fused with what you're doing with Cardoid? Yeah, so I, I would say from the kind of crypto angle, I, I think I've both Carl and I first stumbled upon Bitcoin uh, in like 2012, 2013, uh, more as an interesting concept than nothing uh, than a speculative investment. Um, but we, we played around a bit with Coinbase when it first came out and it was sort of fun for a while and then we sort of forgot about it, or at least I did. Um, I will say Carl is deep into crypto, whereas I'm uh, more of a casual observer that sees a lot of the possibilities with the utility of, of what can be built on top of it. Um, so I, I forgot about it until Carl started talking about how he was collecting visual NFTs, uh, JPEGs essentially, right? And uh, I started poking around and at the time, none of the things that he was collecting specifically interested me per se, but I sort of saw mm -hmm. that there was like a human desire to collect. Um, that was being expressed on top of this essentially a technical innovation. Um, and I think where the, where, where the light switch really, really tripped off is when I, I started listening into a Twitter spaces where uh, I, could, I could hear artists like Latasha, Iman, Europe, um, I'd start talking about like how they were uh, dropping NFTs. Um, and that really made me realize both because I was listening to these artists speak their own stories, their narratives on Twitter and seeing sort of like the market emergent around uh, PFP NFTs and visual NFTs, um, that there was something there that could essentially uh, be a, a better kind of direct to artist, listener to artist monetization method than Bandcamp and Patreon which is what I've been to previously focused on as a way of like making it possible for the listener to support an artist directly mm -hmm. because they like that artist. Mm -hmm. 
Right. So what were you, you know, what was missing in Bandcamp and Patreon, you know, that you noticed? I think uh, with Bandcamp, the, it, it felt like it was a very skeuomorphic experience because you're literally buying merch. Um, and as I understand it, half of Bandcamp sales historically has been actual merch, like t-shirts and vinyl. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, even the fact you're buying an MP3 is, is this sort of this weird artifact of maybe a decade or more, two decades ago. Um, yeah. But it's, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a hard sell, I think, to get someone who can already stream all of an artist's catalog for free to have them buy. Like, essentially, it, it, it's, I, I think of uh, buying stuff on Bandcap. It's, it's sort of like, I wouldn't say it's tipping, but it's somewhere between tipping and merch. Uh, where, as I understand it, for Bandcamp, a good portion of people who buy choose to pay more than the asking price. So in that sense, mm-hmm. it, they're, 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 the, the, the listener is expressing a certain amount of gratitude financially to the, mm-hmm. the artist. Um, the, so, so part of the problem with Bandcamp is the positioning of, of like why a fan would buy an artist's content or merch on Bandcamp. Um, mm-hmm. and the other is that there's not like a closing of the circle where after a fan has bought stuff from the artist, there's no sort of like evidence that the fan can show that they've bought this stuff. Um, I mean, traditionally, you go to a live show, you buy a T-shirt from that show, you wear it around the next day, and all the people at school or the office are like, oh, you went to that show and you like that artist. And that there's sort mm-hmm. of a, a, a round tripping of, of, of vibes that goes from, you know, you, the artist to you, to the people around you that sort of spreads the word. But on Bandcamp, you, you buy something and the MP3 is downloadable for you and you get a receipt and that's kind of it. There is no workflow from there to get the artist and you to start a conversation or anything like that. It, it dead ends. So it feels very transactional. Um, and then with Patreon, uh, Patreon, I think, never really figured out what it wanted to be, I, you know, partly because I think it was intentionally super flexible so the artist could define what their subscription product would, mm-hmm. would, would be, what the benefits would be. Um, but it's a really hard question to ask both an artist and a listener, like, what should this what, what should a script subscription, what should this essentially fan club look and feel like? What, you know, in, in the parlance of Web3 to, to, to today, we usually say like, okay, sure, you bought the NFT, but what utility does it give? I mean, Patreon basically had the same problem. If you sign up for an artist's Patreon, what utility does it give you? Um, and that never became sort of, there, there was no sort of like um, mainstream understanding of what uh, supporting an artist through Patreon meant. So both those, I think they were great ideas or they are great ideas. Um, but they've so they they haven't been able to 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 scale beyond a point of like only the most hardcore fans understanding, and 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 inter- engaging with these services as a means to support the artists they care about. Mm. Okay, so thanks for that, and that is very interesting. You talked about you know closing that circle, right? And um, what do you think like music NFTs bring to the table that is different? I mean, for the average fan, like why buy a music NFT? Uh, I think a couple of reasons, but the way I like to express it is it's an exchange of vibes. Um, and certainly I'm going to start from the perspective of talking about one of one NFTs, which are mm. sort of a, an extreme case because the, 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 the human behavior it leverages is a lot like um, what, what's happened traditionally with collectors of fine art. Um, and it, it's, you know, these one of one NFTs usually sell for, um, you know, 0.1, oh, I'm sorry, not point one. maybe it's more like 0.3, 0.4, 0.5 ETH. Or higher, which is you know in, in dollar terms, but at current rates, maybe like a thousand dollars or more. So we're talking a very, very exclusive number of fans who are able to afford to buy these one of one NFTs. Um, but you know that what what essentially buying a NFT of that uh, uh, of, of, of that cost um, engages the, the the artist and listener in or artist and fan in is a conversation because the artist is wondering who is this person who would pay um, you know an ETH for essentially a digital file. And for the, for the, it, for, for the fan, it means that they are interested enough in this artist or their music or both, that they're willing to front that amount of money to be, that they believe in the artist to that extent that they'd be willing to put that money forth without, you know, expect, without expecting any specific tangible benefit. And I found that, um, you know, as, as a collector of these music NFTs, uh, I can say personally, that usually starts a conversation, um, which uh, ends up being this really great exchange of like, like getting to know each other. Um, so, so for a fan who's 
met an artist or, or, or found an artist that they really uh, see as fascinating, um, it's a great starting point for, for beginning a conversation. And this can happen at several, several levels. Like sometimes it's just like, Hey, you know, glad to meet you. Um, yep. you know, like you tell each other about each other's, uh, backgrounds and how you came to find each other. Um, but sometimes it ends up being some sort of informal collaboration. So, so I, you know, I, I, I generally call that it's, it's vibes. It's the opportunity for something magical to happen, um, at an intellectual or art cultural level. Right. Um, well, so, so that, 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 that to me, that, so that's, that cover covers the, 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 the one of one case, uh, I think for, 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 uh, if you've heard, and, and just to clarify, that's for like, um, the, the, the current one of one, uh, marketplace that I, I see doing, doing well in this is, is doing well in this is uh, catalog or catalog dot works. Um, there's another, uh, NFT, uh, marketplace called sound X, Y, Z or just sound, uh, where it is, um, it, it, it's, they, they sell these uh, NFTs as additions. And I think that appeals, it's, it's a lower price point, but it allows uh, collectors to engage at a more inexpensive level. It's still in the hundreds of dollars at the, the, the levels that ETH is today. Um, but it is a, uh, it, it, I, th I think it, it gives the listener it's 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 a less deep connection, but it still gets the listener and the artist to feel a certain connection with each other. Mm. Yeah, and what do you think are the pros and cons of uh, a collection versus a one-on-one? -on -one? Uh, it really comes down to affordability and level of engagement that the listener and the artist want to have with each other. Um, I think, speaking mostly from a collector's point of view as opposed to an artist, uh, I think it's it's uh, it's a lot like you know collecting. If you have an artist you really like and are willing to spend that kind of uh, money on, um, having a one of one, it feels a lot more meaningful than having one of an edition. Um, so it, it, it for like for me maybe it's simple as that. But for a lot of people, I think the edition is is, is just a lot more affordable. Uh, and it, uh, and still feel like you're playing a part in this ecosystem of someone who's su supporting the artist directly. And I think that is one thing that's important to note is um, for a lot of NFTs, buying them, it's not about owning something. Mm -hmm. It's about supporting an artist you believe in because you know the bulk of what you're paying for that NFT is going directly to that artist. Mm. Great point. Supporting the artist. And speaking of supporting the artist, I think now we want to dive into what you're doing with that awesome app, Quidoid FM, right? Which is available on App Store for download. And when I went in, I saw that integration you had with Sound XYZ. And what was interesting for me was it linked to my Spotify profile. And mm -hmm. immediately I could see like the artists that I listened to and I could scroll through the activity on like Web2 platforms like Spotify, their Twitter. And I could also see for some of them, like I had Daniel Allen, you know, Petlock, you know, yep. like that. I could see yep. the uh, Sound XYZ profile. I could see, you know, on the Web3 side of things, what they're up to. And it kind of gave people that kind of convenient platform, uh, which I felt was really interesting. But if you could maybe from the co-founder's lens, share with us more about the app and what's the purpose and, and the main use case for it. Yeah, uh, so Cardioid existed before um, we really uh, like got, it, got into Web3. Um, so the, the original problem we were trying to solve with Cardioid is how do we get the listener uh, to from, from the point where they like a song to them getting to know the artist, to them liking the artist, to them wanting to support that artist directly. Mm -hmm. So there's a workflow. And I think every fan kind of goes through this as, as, as they kind of, uh, kind, of, kind of come to understand fandom. Um, you know, when, when you, when you find a song you like, you'll end up Googling that artist or looking them up on YouTube or seeing, you know, listening to the other stuff in their catalog. And the more you listen to them, the more you start thinking like, oh, um, you know, like what, what other albums have they released? What other uh, artists have they worked with? What, like there, you get to sort of understand where they came from, what their narrative is, what they're about. And, uh, I think there comes a point for a lot of fans, like they decide they want to go out and buy that artist merch. They want to go out and go to that artist show. They want to support that artist 
whether it's at a emotional level, at a uh, financial level, at a sort of, um, you know, for some people it's a collaborative level, if it's another artist, there's like ways you want to reach out to an artist to, as, as a fan to basically express that you believe in them. Um, and I think there's a journey every, every fan goes through, um, but the, the fact of the matter is it's, it's kind of the same journey. Um, so what cardio tries to do is to get someone who's listening to a song to nudge them, to bring those things into their field of view as they're listening to get to know the artist, to see what the artist offers on Bandcamp or Patreon. If they're a Web3 artist, where are they offering NFTs? Um, and if they collect NFTs, um, what are the NFTs they own? So we're trying to bring that artist's sort of current presence into the field of view of the listener. Um, and so Web3, as it's come to pass, is, is just another dimension to an artist uh, that we try to make part of that, that listening experience for that artist's material. Great, amazing, amazing. And actually what I love about the app was exactly what you said, the ability to listen. You know, there's some apps where you just kind of, you know, get us, they aggregate all these different sources, but it's short of the most important part about music, which is listening to it. And I love how you guys have that really neat UI where there's that player at the bottom and people can can kind of, um, you know, listen to the music as they browse and it kind of makes it a, a kind of a much more richer experience. Yeah, we so so we're sort of originally inspired by um, the, the the sort of the old school way of listening to music, where you would buy someone's record and then you put it on your turntable, and then when you're listening to it, you'll pull the liner notes out, you'll read the liner notes, and sort of like it, it's a fully immersive experience. Um, and I think you know, for for most people who've started listening to music in the past like 10, 15 years, this sounds completely foreign and weird. Much like you know, yeah. like a a kid experiencing live TV and would saying like, "Why can't I pause this?" Like the whole idea of like fully devoting your attention to music is is sort of, is this thing that sort of like vanished as as an archaic thing. Um, but it's still fundamentally like humans are curious, and if it if their curiosity is easily satisfied by something like right in front of them they'll invest that time to go and kind of thumb through and, and, and look through that stuff. And that's really what we're trying to do with cardio. It is instead of making the app, the, of the listening surface about like finding the right playlist and then starting it and then going off and doing something else. We want to make it about like starting the playlist and then getting up to date on what those artists who are, are, who are, who are in that playlist, what they're up to today, what they're about. Um, and, 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 and making that feel like, uh, a worthwhile the thing to do while you're listening to music right right yeah very interesting really cool and and what's the roadmap for cardor you know are there other things that you are kind of integrating into it to kind of make that experience even richer well we're, we're really leading into web3 uh so so prior to web3 we we're really trying to nudge people as they listen to songs more to they basically consider buying this artist music on Bandcamp or signing up for their Patreon. Um, but now with the advent of NFTs, um, we're, 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 we're really dipping into um, getting the, the artists who are native, like Web3 artists, to, to sort of bubble up and show their presences as part of the listening process. Um, so we're, we're, we're really trying to, you know, if, if we know an artist's wallet, uh, we're going to try to... Um, uh, and this this has not been implemented yet, but this is sort of the general kind of where we're going. Um, we want to be able to draw from like what have they minted recently? What's available? What is their what is the market for their stuff like? Um, what are they holding? What have they collected? Um, and the, the really interesting thing about looking at other people's NFT collections, it's much like looking at someone's record collection, where you can sort of see what are what are the what are the records that they've most recently acquired? What are the what are the um, what have they spent the most money on? Uh, those things are totally visible to anybody whose wallet we have access to. Or be, and, and I should caveat this. One thing about Web3 is culturally, it's completely acceptable for other people to look into your wallet. So anybody mm -hmm. can see anybody else's NFT collections. Um, and I think you know that will over time become part of artists' identities. Is like what, uh, whose NFTs have they've collected? And likewise for people who are just great fans um, and who's, who've, who've collected NFTs, um, other fans will want to see, hey, you've got this same artist NFTs that, that I like. Let me see what other NFTs you own. So there's sort of this similar dynamic to um, a collector culture where one collector's collection will inspire another collector 
to find out more about what that what 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 the what it's related to their common sort of uh, um, common common pieces that they that they have, um, and it's it's something you know which I think can be the foundation of I'm not going to call it a social network. I think of it as more of a collector's network um, because you, you don't have to engage with each other to influence each other in, in a world where you can see each other's collections. Right. Yeah. And actually this, this whole idea of, of seeing what other people are kind of consuming is, is very native, right? Like we love finding out who are the inspiration behind our favorite artists. And it's just that now, you know, with Web3, with the idea of being able to kind of dive into each other's wallets, that's a new way of kind of discovering, right? And, and kind right. of growing your... Um, you know your, your circle of, of the kind of content that you um, that you that you see, yeah. And so um, I wanted to you know move from the roadmap to some of the the challenges in in launching an app like that. You know, I I would presume sometimes um, people are already discovering on Spotify's awesome algorithm or on Twitter already. There's enough you know um, uh, to consume people for hours. So like you know going on a separate app you know sometimes you know could be uh, additional barrier to entry mm -hmm. i was wondering if you could just touch on you know the other side of things what are some of the challenges in, in launching this and in scaling this app yeah absolutely uh it has been actually really challenging uh, pre-web 3 to to launch cardioid in a way that gets people to use it more than once um, i think cardioid it, it essentially lets an existing spotify premium user sign in and use the cardioid user interface instead of the Spotify user interface. So you have access to your existing playlists. Uh, you have access to Discover Weekly and Release Radar, all the things that you're used to being able to access to Spotify, but it's a different user interface. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's a core group of people who use it on a somewhat regular basis, but it's really hard to replace Spotify just because Spotify is that good most of the time for most people. Um, so a real challenge for us is like, how do we gain and keep users who genuinely have that share our point of view at that when you're listening, you should check up on what that artist is doing. Um, now, what Web3 sort of like how Web3 changes that is there's a real big focus on the artists, especially these the, the independent artists who are, are coming up in Web3 on being present in social media, um, on being uh, a personality that people want to engage with. And because that artist's persona is as much a product as the music that they put out, um, the, the fans who come into Web3 now get to know the artist often before they get to know their music. Mm -hmm. So those fans who are coming in to, to, to Web3 today um, aren't jaded the same way that most existing Spotify users are jaded. Most of existing Spotify users will be like, okay, yeah, I'll keep playing Rap Caviar or I'll keep playing whatever playlist I, or, I've been, or just my likes. Um, but if, if right now the, the way you find and uh, explore artists is a, through a combination of like getting to know the artist and listening to their material. Uh, so it's much like it takes us back to the day of like when you had to spend deliberate time at a record store to figure out what record you were going to go buy. Um, you would go and like, you know, you try to figure out who this artist was um, uh, of this, you know, uh, like uh it would be part of your purchasing decision. Mm. And in some sense, like that, the artists being much more of a focal point in Web3 than they are in the traditional Web2 and before world, um, I think gives us an opportunity uh, mm. to, 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 to make our sort of listening point of view uh, be a, a great solution for people who are getting into Web3 today, Web3 music mm. today. Right, right. Now, give us a sense of like how Cardoid actually gets all this information because I found it amazing that you know, you could kind of, um, kind of almost personalize the experience for mm -hmm. me when I went to the app just based on the artist. I guess there's some of the Spotify integration and all that, but um, you, there, are, there seems to be a lot of other things that you guys added. Like I was in someone's Wikipedia page, you know, I was like, um, I believe I saw someone's wallet. I was seeing like a whole bunch of different integrations that I, I think go beyond like, you know, the social media links that are on someone's, on the artist's Spotify profile. So how are you guys doing that at scale? Yeah, no, that's that's uh, I love that question. And that's one of the hardest problems to solve because there is no directory for artists of like what is their Instagram, what is their Twitter, what is their ETH wallet, what is their uh, Wikipedia. So exactly. we've had to build that ourselves. Um, wow. So we seeded it with you know we 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 had essentially professional researchers um, seed the data 
But then from there, we built out a, a way for essentially the listeners to add data on their own. So it, it's, a, it's basically user-generated content. Uh, and the, the, the way that you um, would add someone's Wikipedia is if you go in and you're listening to an artist and you discover, oh, uh, they don't seem to have an Instagram or Wikipedia or a Bandcamp page. You can go in and search for that page to see if it exists on any of those, those properties and submit it. And then there's a, a um, sort of a validation process on the back end where uh, we make sure that the submission seems valid and then we'll add it to the database. So it's, it's, a, it's a database with, uh, I think it's currently close to 40,000 artists in it. It's not a huge number considering there's millions of artists out there, um, but it's a significant, uh, it has significant coverage for most artists uh, who are making music today. Um, and we hope to build a community around that. I mean, just to get back to the roadmap, one thing we're really intent on is building a community around Cardioid as um, a really artist-centric way to listen to music. And the way that people sort of like um, participate in that community is like entering and correcting and validating that the, the artists that they like, that they're that their directory entries are correct. And if they suddenly become Web3 artists and they're listed on catalog, that that catalog um, account is in there. Um, if there's a Wikipedia article that's added, that Wikipedia ar- that, that that also gets added, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's that's a big part of what makes I think Cardioid really special is that we have data for all these artists. Artists don't have mm-hmm. to, you know, create an account on Cardioid and, and add their stuff like building something on Linktree. Um, we're trying to get the listeners to help them do that because, like, by and large, listeners care about the artists that they they really they really jam to. Nice. But how are these like, you know, 40,000 artists selected? Because like what you said, there are like, you know, hundreds of thousands of artists, right? So how, mm-hmm. how are these yeah. special pools actually uh, come about? Um, it's it's our user base um, and our researchers that have like kept it growing and kept kept it accurate. Um, and over time, you know, our, our hope is to get more people on board. And, um, you know, we've, we've toyed with the idea of maybe this should eventually be a DAO where... Um, you know, the people who are actively, you know, participating in it end up having some governance over uh, the, the, or ownership over that process of like making sure everybody, all artists data, um, and maybe it also includes collector's data is inside this directory. Um, so we do have a website we've built out. Uh, if you go to um, app.cardio.fm, um, you'll see a directory um, just a purely directory uh, means of browsing, uh, sorry, uh, brow- you can, you can search for artists in the directory. Um, and we haven't, we haven't yet added a way for you to sign in with your wallet to add additional artists or add a, add data for ex- existing artists, but that's on our roadmap. Wow. Really interesting. And actually, how about, have you guys thought of doing like a Cardoy NFT series where you reward your scholars, you know, people who are contributing to like. You know, like uh, the database, yeah. like they do more, you kind of drop drop them some NFTs and it kind of gives them some recognition within the community. Have you thought of something like that? I think it's quite yes. down your alley. Yes. Yeah, no, it totally is a great, it's a great idea. Uh, and we, we've definitely toyed with the idea of, well, you know, to get to the point where you're editing the directory, you have to sign in with your wallet. And um, maybe we make sure that, you know, you have a cardio at NFT in your wallet before giving you permission to edit something or validate someone else's edit. Um, so there's, there's, there's definitely, you know, uh, standards that have been created on or experiments on other sort of like DAOs and communities with NFTs that um, we're watching to see, you know, what, what are good mechanics that get people excited about being part of community and then token gating access to functionality that only NFT holders can have. Um, so, yes, it's, I think there's huge opportunities there. Yeah, awesome, awesome. And I guess for our viewers who are really curious about uh, Cardioid and, you know, um, what you're doing, what, what, are you, what are you looking for, you know, in the, in the coming months? Are you looking to onboard more people um, as part of the research team? Are you looking for more developers? How can people who are interested in what you're doing come alongside? Uh, mostly we're looking for people to just give the app a whirl and try, try listening um, from the cardioid point of view of like being able to look at an artist, uh, artist's Instagram while you're listening, uh, scroll through their tweets. Um, and we, we really want people to um, have, a, have a try and, and get their feedback on whether it's working for them. Um, 
uh, because I think, you know, like ultimately it, the cardio will only work if we can get a, a, a set of users who really vibe with the product. Um, and that's really the, the stage we're at right now where we look at how the product's being used. We talk to the people who are using it and uh, we try to, to, to make them happy about connecting with artists and, and listening in a way where their attention is focused on the app and the artists in the app, as opposed to um, going off and browsing Instagram alone or, or, or watching a, uh, watching YouTube videos while listening or, or something to that effect. Right. Okay, that's great. So um, we're going to be also linking uh, CXY's Twitter in the info section. So if you guys want to find out more about the latest updates or to get in touch directly, uh, you can drop him a, a DM. I believe they're open, right? Your DMs? Yeah, absolutely. DMs are open. We've got a Discord. And if you just go to cardioid.fm uh, from that website, you can go and download the app or join the Discord. And uh, we're always on the Discord. So um, hit us up. We love to chat. Nice, nice, nice. So now CXY, something we always ask everyone on the show, right? Uh, we have two questions. And the first one is, um, what are you excited about in this space of Web3 and music, both now and in the coming months? Um, I'm really excited about how, the, how collectors are starting to pay more attention to each other's collections. Um, I think... It, Prior to now, when you buy a music NFT, there's not really easy ways to listen to it, even if you're buying your own. And certainly if another collector, you see other collectors buying stuff, you can't listen to theirs very easily. Um, but the there's apps getting built um, and there's uh, people really starting to experiment with um, listening and viewing each other's collections. Uh, and I think that's gonna change the way people think about collecting music NFTs. Um, because until you see another collector collecting, it's the whole concept of collecting is really abstract. Um, the, the analogy I like to use is uh, for those who've watched MTV Cribs, um, there's usually a part in MTV Cribs where you'll go into a celebrity's game room. Uh, and in that game room, there'll be like sports jerseys and memorabilia. There'll be like, you know, balls of all sorts that are signed. And, you know, I remember when I saw that for the first time, I had this realization like people collect that stuff. <laughs> but, you know, at, when you see a collection, yeah. then, there's something that tugs at your very sort of like soul that like, oh, wow, I, I, could, I could amass something like that too to express my love and passion for this, this domain. Um, and right now with NFTs, like people are buying NFTs um, and, you know, by and large, there's like people buy NFTs to speculate on them. And there's people who buy NFTs because they, you know, they want to support the art or they just like that thing that the NFT is, um, whether it's, you know, music or a PFP or a graphic or whatever. There's just no way for no simple way for people to look at each other's collections. But once that's in place, um, I think that's going to change how the general public views NFTs. Okay. Any specific platforms? Uh, because we want to give some alpha to our viewers. Any any projects that you are kind of... Uh, yes, there, there's a couple of Web3 specific players that I'll call out. One is uh, Future Tape, which is made by um, the guy behind uh, uh, Hype Machine. Uh, his name's Anthony. Uh, you can find him on Twitter as uh, at Fascinated. Um, another that uh, has come out recently is uh, SpinApp. And, and what these are is it, it's, it, they're, they're really simple players that allow you to look in other people's wallets and just listen to what music NFTs they've collected. Um, they also let you know what music NFTs are coming on the market uh, that have been listed on catalog or sound XYZ. Um, but these, these basically, the, these apps are making it easier to, to sort of understand what the music NFT marketplace looks like and what people's collections look like. And I think that's super exciting. Um, there's also something called Sleeve Note, uh, which is building, I don't think they've released uh, their NFT supported version yet, but they're building a way for collectors to uh, curate their NFTs alongside the music that they just, they love, that whether or not it's Web3, so that you can see a person's musical preferences just look by looking at their Sleeve Note profile. Nice, nice, nice. Okay. And the next question is, you know, for people who really enjoyed this chat and are just so curious about this space but don't know where to start, um, besides yourself, of course, who are some people that they may want to follow that could just help them to really gain more knowledge on this space? I think one of the best places to start is from uh, some of the great artists who are 
uh, like NFT, uh, sorry, they're the Web3 native artists mm -hmm. who are doing a lot of work to just spread the word amongst uh, other artists and fans about how Web3 works for them um, and are pushing out really amazing NFTs. So Latasha is, is I think, a great one. Uh, Iman Europe is also great. Sassy Black, also great. Um, and, you know, they're, they're literally, you know, the, on Twitter, just follow at uh, Call Me Latasha, at Iman Europe, or at Sassy Black underscore. Okay, great, great. And of course, not forgetting CXY and Cardoid FM in that list as well, right? <laughs> yes, absolutely. I appreciate that. Nice, nice, nice. Now, um, there's another question that, you know, as you were talking earlier that I, I, I thought about and we were talking about collectors and you see this idea of collectors growing. I mean, there's a worry of late, right? In this time of like April 2020, you know, where people are noticing like um, ETH NFT volume is really dropping back almost to like, you know, June last year's lows. And, and we see mm -hmm. this not just on Ethereum, even on Solana as well. So there is a lot of worry about like whether it, there is... Um, you know, is, is is this the end or is this kind of like um, going to be a, a bear market for a while and then will the things that I buy end up becoming worthless? And there's some worry and, and, and kind of, I guess, fat, you know, in, in this space. Like, what are your thoughts on music NFTs? Do you think that, you know, um, you know, it's it's here to stay or it's going to, is it going going to go through a kind of a low period for a while? Because I think right now, when we look at top collections, a lot of them tend to be like PFP, profile mm -hmm. picture based. Uh, NFTs. If we look at NF, uh, OpenSea's top twenty, it's mostly that sort of projects. So, yep. um, yeah. What What are your thoughts on that? Given the grim kind of a reading that 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 we're in right now with regards to volume on NFTs. Yeah, I I think it's going to fluctuate over time. Um, there's if you look at any sort of like huge disruptive tech cycle, there's often a period of hype followed by a period of sort of like either a plateau or a lull, maybe even a crash. Um, where the interest, basically the hype outpaces the actual, the reality. Um, and the people who come on board, um, you know, sometimes it's just, uh, you know, miss, miss, miss set expectations, um, end up disappointed. Um, and I think that happens with any technology that isn't, you know, mature and sort of where the UI isn't friendly yet, because certainly that's a problem across the board with, with anything having to do with NFTs. Um, I think, during these periods of, 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 of lulls or, 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 or just downtimes, um, stuff keeps getting built. The engineers are always working. Um, and the problems are well understood. A lot of it is like, how do we onboard people more smoothly? How do we get rid of these sort of like opportunities for scams? How do we get like, what is the native NFT product for, what, what is the music NFT natively? Does it have to be like a three minute pop single that's made for radio? Or can it be something that's like made off the cuff based on a mood? Can it be just like a beat? Can it be a stem? Like there's all these sort of, possibilities that have to be explored as we come to come to kind of like, you know, the, come to a mainstream understanding of what a music NFT is. Because right now all that stuff is abstract and the people who kind of came in at the beginning of the hype cycle are, are the natives who probably have a ton of, you know, uh, gains from crypto that they're willing to just spend to experiment. And I think that's just a healthy, natural part of any sort of like new idea where the builders, the creators, or the consumers are all sort of like getting their heads around it at the same time. Um, there'll be parts of like exuberance because something seems to be working and then there'll be like crushing defeat, you know, the sense of crushing defeat when something falls apart, like like volumes of, of transactions are going to go down when, when, when ETH crashes. Um, but, you know, for, for anyone taking the long view, I think, whether you're in the tech or the culture, there's a lot of evidence that um, th this is a sea change. Um, that may take may take a year, maybe it takes two years, maybe it takes five years. Um, but it is a long game, and I think there's a bit of an inevitability to it uh, for 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 those who've sort of gotten their heads around what you know. Fundamentally, it's it's a really efficient way for listeners to support the art or the artists they care about directly. And then it comes down to like, well, how do we make it possible so that both sides feel like this is fun and equitable? Um, and that's that's what we're all trying to figure out from a from a you know UI a technology a cultural perspective, um, the art form like all that stuff is being built at the same time, um, mm -hmm. and uh, they're going to be bumps along the way. So just like we should all hold tight. Hold tight. Yeah. Wow. Great. Great. I think that's a great way to round up 
the show, you know, with that anecdotal advice. And thanks so much, CXY, for spending the time with us and really educating us on the awesome work that your team is doing on Cardioid. Uh, once again, we'll also be linking their app in the info section. And today, I really took away some really interesting points. I think, uh, you know, learning from CXY about how um, Web3 helps to close that circle, that loop between the artist and the creator. Uh, I talked about, you know, the beauty of kind of knowing each other and having that exchange between collector and fan that is now possible because of some of this new technology. Um, and I think uh, you also touched on the idea of different kinds of collections, uh, one-on-ones uh, versus um, uh, additions and how they differ in terms of affordability and level en engagement. And these are some strategies that, you know, artists can think about when they have their NFTs. And... Um, of course, we also went into Cardoid and the awesome platform in trying to help both artists and fans to be able to really discover in a more uh, deep, deeper and interactive way across different platforms. And we also learned that um, anyone can contribute. They can add their profiles and, and add to the collective information um, that's available on, on Cardoid. And um, hopefully they'll start releasing some NFT soon to reward people who do that. <laughs> And, um, you know, uh, and, and of course, you know, rounding up with your thoughts about how, you know, even in the bad times, things are going to get built. And, and uh, you know, when we hang tight, you know, we're going to see some um, beautiful days ahead and um, new levels of innovation that better help to connect us music lovers um, to the artists and vice versa. So once again, thanks CXY for your time. Um, we uh, appreciate you. And um, once again, thank you all for joining. This has been a wonderful time on the second episode of Ben Wagon's Wet 3 and Music. We're going to close us out. Thanks a lot, Clarence. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. We got the Maroon Shirt Brothers in the house. Yep. Oh, yeah.